Hello. We are ready now for our next lecture in the Gospel of Luke. Earlier, we have noted that Jesus was somewhat reluctant to receive uh, the identity that he was the Messiah, particularly from demons who were uh, sort of like you don't want advertising from the wrong side. But now the issue of his identity is going to come more to the forefront in the gospel. And so we want to look at that in this next section. In particular, it is this question, who is Jesus? This is the basic question, as I mentioned in a previous lecture, that is fundamental to all four gospels. Now, Luke has not addressed this directly so far. Rather, this has been addressed uh, implicitly in a variety of kinds of ways. Uh, for instance, uh, the a prenatal response of John the Baptist to Jesus when uh, uh, Mary visits Elizabeth and uh, the, 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 uh, the baby John, who is still unborn, leaps in his mother's womb in response to Jesus, the Messiah. And then there is the angelic annunciation to the shepherds when the angels announced to them, unto he was born today in David's city, a savior who is Christ the Lord. Uh, these kinds of events basically uh, imply the question, if this is what happened, who then is Jesus? The descent of the dove and the heavenly voice, this is my son whom I love. The recognition of Jesus by demons, you are the holy one from God. Or Jesus' action in pronouncing forgiveness of sins when uh, the paralytic is put before him and he says to him, uh, man, your sins are forgiven. Uh, and his power to heal and to raise the dead, uh, even to control nature. All of these imply this basic question, who is Jesus? But now in Luke's gospel, Jesus is going to broach this question quite directly. Jesus is going to be confessed as the Messiah and revealed as the Messiah because he's going to actually ask his disciples who they think he is. And so there's a number of narratives that uh, either directly uh, ask this question or very closely uh, imply this question. Now, in doing this, we need to remember that in the ancient world, there are a number of famous, uh, what were called divine men. There's actually a Greek uh, expression for this. Uh, this is the expression uh, theosinaire. Uh, so there's a number of these people who traveled around. They were claiming to work wonders, uh, uh, claim to perform healings, claim to do miracles, even claim to do exorcisms. Uh, all of these are the kinds of things, of course, that Jesus actually did do. Uh, however, Luke wants to be sure, I think, that Jesus, who did all of these things, is not simply confused with being some sort of a theos and heir, some sort of divine man. Even Herod Antipas is asking, who is Jesus? In fact, Luke says he would have liked to have seen Jesus. He was just Curious, especially when some of his retainers suggested to him that Jesus was John the Baptist raised from the dead. Uh, that would make Herod nervous uh, because Herod, of course, is the one who had John executed. So if Jesus would John raise from the dead, that would not be good news for Herod. In any case, Herod himself is, is uh, curious about Jesus and would have liked to have seen him. So that brings us to what we sometimes call Peter's great confession. Uh, Peter uh, is going to acclaim that Jesus is the Messiah. And probably he is serving as a spokesperson for all of the rest of the disciples. But on one particular occasion, while Jesus was praying privately and his disciples were with him, uh, he posed for them this question. Who do people think I am? Who do the crowds think I am? Well, they responded in a variety of ways. Some people had various theories. Some people did, in fact, think that he might be Elijah the, uh, the prophet or that he might be John the Baptist risen from the dead or one of the other great prophets that were long since dead. Uh, the fact that Jesus did so many uh, incredible miracles uh, suggested that he was something way beyond just an average rabbi or average teacher. Uh, but then the more funda fundamental question was posed by Jesus. <clears throat> so he not only asked, who do the crowd say, I, say that I am? But now he asked his disciples directly, how about you? Who 
who do you say I am? And it is in response to this that Peter offers what is the great confession. You are the Christ, or you are the Messiah of God. Of course, Christ is the Greek form. Messiah is the Hebrew form. Uh, possibly Peter may have answered in Aramaic. But nonetheless, it is the answer to the question that Jesus is the Messiah. Now, uh, in a previous lesson, I suggested that many scholars, uh, or at least I pointed out that many scholars have called Jesus' reluctance to accept the title Messiah as the messianic secret. And in fact, on this occasion, after Peter has declared that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, Jesus is going to urge his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Presumably, we think this was due because uh, this was due to the common political vision that most people thought the Messiah would be a militaristic figure. Many of them remembered the heroism of Judas Maccabeus in the intertestamental period and how Judas <clears throat> and his brothers had risen up against the Syrian Greeks who were desecrating the temple, and they had won a marvelous victory. Uh, so they often thought of the Messiah as being someone like that. In fact, the name Judas was a very popular name in the first century for Jewish boys, and probably because the name Judas goes back to Judas Maccabeus. <clears throat> in any case, uh, Jesus now begins to outline the character of his messiahship in a way very different from the popular opinion. He begins frankly to talk about his coming suffering, his rejection in Jerusalem, his death on the cross, and ultimately his resurrection. This is the character of Jesus' messiahship. If his disciples were ready to accept him as the messiah, they must do so on his terms not based upon popular imagery. And the link that Jesus is make, uh, making between his messiahship and his suffering is probably a link that no one else would have made. There was in the prophets, particularly in the latter chapters of the book of Isaiah, a very striking figure who was a suffering figure, but he is not called by the title Messiah. Rather, he is called the Eved Yahweh or the servant of the Lord. But in linking together Messiahship, which is the imagery of the son of David, uh, anointed of David, and the imagery of suffering, Jesus is bringing together these two Old Testament prophetic figures, the figure of the son of David, who is anointed as the king, and the figure of the suffering servant of the Lord, who will give his life in behalf of his people. And so Jesus, in talking about his messiahship as a messiahship of suffering is in fact dealing with the issue of fulfillment, but it is a fulfillment no, that, that, that no one actually in his generation had really thought much about. And if his disciples are going to be genuine disciples of the Lord, they also must embrace the cross. They must be willing to take up their cross and to follow Jesus every day. Now, it's in the context of this discussion that Jesus is going to say to them that some of you will not die before you have seen God's kingdom come. Uh, what did Jesus mean by this? The fact that he said some here will not die means that whatever he meant, it must be within the lifetimes of those to whom he was talking. He's not talking about something at the end of the age or the end of the world. He's talking about something in the relatively near future, that they would not die before they had seen the kingdom of God. So interpreters have uh, read this variously. Jesus doesn't explain what he means. And so the reader is kind of left to decide what he thinks Jesus might have meant. One uh, very popular interpretation is that Jesus is really talking about his transfiguration, which in fact is going to be taken up in the next visions. I'm sorry, sorry, the next passages, this, this uh, issue that uh, the disciples see him changed before their very eyes into a glowing person with glowing garments. Maybe that's what he meant when he talked about the coming of the kingdom of God. At least Peter in 2 Peter is going to refer to this event and say some of us were there and we saw this event. We actually saw this with our own eyes. <clears throat> 
Some would say that maybe he's talking about the appearances of Jesus to the disciples after Easter. So after the crucifixion and Jesus' resurrection, Jesus will make a number of appearances. In fact, Luke's gospel is going to describe several of those post-resurrection appearances of Jesus. So maybe the kingdom of God that Jesus is talking about, or the rule of God, is going to be expressed in his resurrection from the dead as the risen king. Others link this with something that's going to happen a number of years down the line. Now, if Jesus is in his early 30s, at the time he is doing public ministry, and he began his ministry at the age of 30, uh, in just a bit less than 40 years, Jerusalem is going to be destroyed by the Romans under the leadership of Titus Vespasian. The temple will be destroyed. And so there are some that interpret the idea of the coming of God's kingdom as linked with the destruction of the temple. When the temple is destroyed in Jerusalem, then the real remaining temple would be the body of Christians who are the new temple of the Holy Spirit. And in this sense, uh, some would say when Jesus said, some will not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God come, uh, they think Jesus might be referring to this, that the church is the true kingdom of God, the true temple of God, that will be obviously the only remaining temple after the Jewish temple has been destroyed. And then some would just kind of in general say it refers to the complex of all of these events, his death, his resurrection, perhaps the descent of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, uh, all of these kinds of things. So <clears throat> this is an area that is uh, debated by interpreters. Uh, there's not a clear consensus on how this should be understood. But whatever it means, it means that some of those disciples that were standing there with Jesus at the time that he said this, they would still be living when they saw the kingdom of God come in this special sense. <clears throat> Following this, Jesus is going to work his way northward. Uh, we don't know exactly where he was uh, in terms of this mountain. It does mention in Luke that Jesus is going to go to, a, to some mountain in the north. This would be almost, uh, almost certainly the mountains in the south Lebanon range. Um, in Matthew's gospel, uh, it's going to actually describe this as a very high mountain. Uh, Luke doesn't use that description. He just says mountain. But in any case, the highest mountain in the South Lebanon range is Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon rises to about 9,000 feet. And since uh, the Sea of Galilee is about five to 600 feet below sea level, uh, the elevation change from the Sea of Galilee to the top of Mount Hermon is quite a significant change. In any case, Jesus is going to take his disciples on this mountain, and then he's going to take Peter, James, and John, these three, with him a bit further than the others, up on this mountain. In fact, these three are going to accompany Jesus two or three other times in special situations. Um, you may remember uh, in reading the story of Jesus' prayer in Gethsemane that Peter, James, and John were taken a little bit further than the others. They seem to be the primary leaders among the 12. So these are the, the three, if you will, that are leaders among other leaders. In any case, Luke describes Jesus as ascending this mountain to pray. And as is typical in Luke's gospel, uh, Luke has this uh, emphasis on prayer. And so he takes these three with him for prayer. And suddenly his appearance changed. His clothes became radiant, and two figures are seen talking with him, and they represent Moses and Elijah. Now, I suppose the question could be asked, how, how in the world did they know this was Moses and Elijah? Uh, did Moses have, uh, I don't know, tables of stone tucked under his arm, or uh, did Elijah come dressed in uh, camel skins? <clears throat> we don't actually know. Maybe it's in the conversation between these two figures and Jesus that it became apparent that they were Moses and Elijah. But at least there seems to be no doubt on the, on, the, on the part of the apostles that these two figures represent the law and the prophets, Moses and Elijah. Uh, Luke also does something interesting in this description. He uses 
a word that none of the other Gospels use. It is the word Exodus. He says that Moses and Elijah were talking to Jesus about his Exodus. Uh, and the word Exodus, of course, means his, his departure. Now, uh, probably they are talking about his death or possibly his departure from the world in the ascension back to the Father. That's not entirely clear, but it is interesting that you, Luke uses this term. Uh, he seems to be deliberately linking the death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus to the ancient uh, leaving, uh, the, the ancient Israelites who are leaving Egypt in the Exodus, because he uses this term. In fact, in the Greek Septuagint, the term Exodus will become the title of the second book in the Torah, and we continue to use it today. We still call it the Exodus, uh, and it comes from this very Greek word, the Greek word Exodus. Peter, <clears throat> who is, uh, if nothing else, is always ready to speak, uh, he says, uh, maybe, we should, maybe we should build a memorial here. Maybe we should uh, uh, do something special here on top of this mountain. And it's in the, in the context of, of the suggestion that a heavenly voice very similar to the one that appeared at Jesus' baptism, once again speaks out of the heavens and says, this is my son. This is now the second time that the voice of God has actually spoken aloud. The first time was in the Jordan River when Jesus was baptized. This one is in the Transfiguration where God says, this is my son. Well, they have to come down from the mountain and, and maybe that's a good thing for all Christians to remember. Uh, you can be on the mountain, but at some point you've got to come off of the mountain and come back to, to uh, ordinary life. Um, and as they come down the mountain the next day, they're going to encounter a child who was demonized, and Jesus is going to heal him. And as they are coming down, uh, Jesus is, um, uh, is going to do this miracle, but then he's going to once again start talking about what will happen to him in the future. Again, this has to do with his messianic identity. And he is going to describe himself as a suffering Messiah and also as a Messiah who will be betrayed. Now, betrayal is a special kind of suffering. It means that someone who is close to you has worked against you, has worked behind the scenes, has been disloyal to you. And so Jesus takes this opportunity to emphasize what he said earlier. He is not only going to suffer, he is going to be betrayed. Now, <clears throat> there were quite a number of figures in the first century who in one way or another tried to, to be the Messiah or tried to claim that they were the Messiah. We read more details about them in the writings of Flavius Josephus than anywhere else. And I mentioned uh, uh, Josephus, I think, maybe in the last couple of lectures, uh, this historian from the first century. But Josephus uh, gives quite, uh, quite an extensive description of various leaders who claim to be liberators of the Jews, Messiah-like figures. But usually they had very high political aspirations or in some cases were quite materialistic, uh, certainly militaristic. And Jesus does not go down that road. All of these kinds of militaristic expectations that people may have had for the Messiah, Jesus shatters those with his announcement that he's going to go to Jerusalem and suffer and die. His Messiahship is not after the pattern that was popularly expected. So when we get to Luke chapter 9 and verse 51, we are going to get to a very special transition in Luke's gospel. From the end of chapter 9 until almost the end of chapter 19, so roughly 10 chapters, Luke is going to depict Jesus as on his way to Jerusalem. So in chapter 9 verse 51, uh, Luke is going to say Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem. And thereafter, at various points, there's going to be this continual phrase as Jesus was on his way or something comparable to that. <clears throat> because of that, scholars have called this the travel narrative, or as I have said here, the travelogue. It's basically a long trip to Jerusalem, not a very direct trip, 
It's not that Jesus has set out to go to Jerusalem and he's there in about three days, but rather he is always facing Jerusalem. He's always on his way. Sometimes he's traveling east, sometimes he's traveling west, sometimes he's actually in the north of Galilee, sometimes he's actually headed south. In fact, mostly he's going to be headed south. But all of these are ways of saying he is going to Jerusalem. So, <clears throat> excuse me, here, here are some of those phrases. Now, later in chapter 9, it says, as they were walking along the road. And then in chapter 10, he sent them ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. And then later in chapter 10, as Jesus and his disciples were on the way. In chapter 13, Jesus made his way toward Jerusalem. Chapter 14, large crowds were traveling with Jesus. Chapter 17, now on his way to Jerusalem. Chapter 18, Jesus says, we are going up to Jerusalem. Chapter 19, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. And finally, near the end of chapter 19, as Jesus approached Jerusalem. These repeating phrases in Luke's gospel that Jesus was on his way are all ways of saying that Jesus is facing Jerusalem. He has determined that this is where the climax will be. And as he goes along, he often warns his disciples of what will happen when he gets there. That means there's a cost to following Jesus. In this extended travel narrative, Jesus is going to challenge his disciples to take up the cross and to follow him. He's also going to encounter various people who either offer to go along with him, and of course many of them did go with him, but some of them in fact did not, uh, and he's also going to call people to follow him. And he warns them of the hardships of discipleship. Uh, being a disciple of Jesus, taking up the cross every day, means that this is going to be a hard road. When I read this passage, I think especially of the statements of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the uh, Lutheran pastor who was martyred in World War II and who was hung uh, at direct orders of Adolf Hitler because he was perceived as, uh, as being uh, a threat to the Third Reich. Uh, and Bonhoeffer, in his uh, uh, quite well-known work called The Cost of Discipleship, says that when Jesus bids a man to follow him, he calls him to come and die. I think that is exactly, in fact, what Jesus is doing with his disciples. He is warning them this is going to be costly. Now, there are people that make excuses, of course. There's the man that said, well, I, I want to go. Uh, I, I will go with you, but I need to wait until my father dies. Uh, when he says, I want to go bury my father, I don't think that means that his father had just died. I think what he means is I want to go home and wait until my father dies, and I will bury him, and then I'll come and follow you. Uh, but Jesus simply urges, you, you, have to, you have to put this in a different perspective. Um, you have to forsake all and follow me. You can't, you can't wait. You can't uh, wait till it's uh, more convenient for you to do so. Uh, the call must take priority over all other things. And when you come to follow me, you must never look backward. So Jesus is, in fact, on the road. Now, in this uh, travel narrative, Jesus is going to send out 70 of his disciples, two by two, to go to the villages between him and Jerusalem and to preach the gospel of the kingdom. Now, I should say something about the number 70 first off, because some of your English translations are going to say 70, and some are going to say 72. There is a a difference in several of the early Greek manuscripts. So they don't all say one number. They Some of them say 70, some say 72. But that is pretty understandable because this number 70 probably has a precedent in the book of Genesis in what we call the Table of Nations. If you look in the book of Genesis, the Table of Nations numbers 70 nations of the world. But there are some versions of the Torah that have 72 nations of the world. And so because you have uh, this differential in Genesis, you have the same differential in the manuscripts of Luke's gospel. Uh, 
So I don't care whether you call it 70 or 72. I'm going to use the, the number 70 for convenience sake. But I think the point that Luke is making is that this sending out of 70 witnesses is a prelude to the widening out of the message of Jesus beyond the Jewish circle so that it includes the nations of the world. This is kind of an implicit suggestion that the sending out of the 70 uh, is a way of saying that the gospel is going to go beyond the range of Jewishness. So just like when Jesus sent out the 12 uh, apostles earlier, two by two, now that he's sending out 70, they are to trust their support to the generosity of those that listen to him. Uh, when they go to a village, if they're received, if they're fed and, and housed, uh, that they are to bless those people. Uh, and uh, the people that received them would also receive Jesus. To receive Jesus' messenger is to receive him. If they were rejected, on the other hand, they could simply shake the dust from their sandals as a protest, and they would go to the next village. I think I mentioned uh, also previously that that is an action that will be used by St. Paul in a place where he was rejected. So in the mission of the 70, when they returned, Jesus said, I saw Satan fall from heaven. There's been quite a bit of discussion about that statement by Jesus. Does he mean he saw Satan fall from heaven uh, before the creation of the world, way back in the beginning? Or does he mean he saw Satan fall from heaven in the mission of the 70 who have been given authority to exercise demons uh, and to heal the sick? Uh, I'm inclined to think that what Jesus is talking about is what happens in the mission to the 70. But you will find other interpreters who think that maybe Jesus is referring backward all the way to the very beginning of time. In any case, Jesus is going to be traveling now uh, down through what is called Perea. Uh, in leaving Galilee, he is going to cross the Jordan River, uh, moving uh, eastward, then down the east side of the Jordan River through what is called Perea, which was largely inhabited by Jewish people. So there's kind of three big uh, geographical areas for Jewish settlement. In the north, there's Galilee. In the Transjordan, or east of the Jordan, there is Perea. And then in the south, on the west side of the river, there is Judea. Jews generally crossed the river and went down the east side for two reasons. One, they would be traveling among their own kind of people through Perea, which was largely Jewish. And second, they could avoid going to Samaria. Samaria is the more direct route from Galilee to Judea, but there wasn't a lot of love lost between Jews and Samaritans, a subject I'll talk about in just a moment. So when they got down to the south of Perea, they would cross the Jordan again at Jericho. Now, the Jordan River is not a huge river, but there are only a very few places where it is relatively easy to ford this river. In most places, the banks are quite steep. So even though it's not, uh, we're not talking about the, you know, the Mississippi River or the Amazon River or something like that, not even the Blue Danube, uh, this is a, a river that by, by world standard is a fairly small river, but, but the banks are quite steep. So there's not a lot of places to cross easily, but Jericho was one of those places. So in the north, they would cross from Galilee into Perea. They would come down through Perea southward until they got to Jericho, and then they would cross at Jericho, and then they would head up toward Jerusalem. And this is the area where they would leave Jericho and head up to the mountains into Jerusalem, which was in the central mountain spine. Uh, so this is, uh, this, is, uh, this is the Jericho road. Now, most people did not travel this road as single individuals. Most people who went in this road went in groups because this is pretty desolate uh, area, a pretty desolate area, and bandits frequently hid out in the ravines and they would attack travelers and they would burgle them, they would rob them, sometimes they would even kill them. Uh, so it was not safe to travel this road as a lone individual. But Jesus is going to give a parable about someone who did travel this road as a lone individual. And it comes out of a question that was posed to Jesus. And to this, Jesus gives what we call the parable of the Good Samaritan. 
So we come to the parable of the Good Samaritan. This is found only in Luke's Gospel. And it focuses upon the benevolence of a Samaritan. And it's in answer to a question. There is a, a young man that speaks to Jesus and says, uh, what should I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, so how do you read it? In other words, how do you read the Torah? And the man says, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind, and you should love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says, that's a good answer. That's the right answer. But then the man extends his question, and he says, yeah, but who is my neighbor? And it is to this question that Jesus gives the parable of the Good Samaritan. Now, this is only in the Gospel of Luke, but it is about the time that Jesus probably is getting either close to the, uh, the, the, the Jericho Road or maybe is already on it. And in any case, uh, he tells the story. There was a man traveling on the Jericho Road. He was attacked by bandits. They left him for dead and stole everything he had. As it turned out, there was a priest and a Levite who also were walking on that road, and they saw this wounded man. But neither of them wanted to go over to help him. Uh, possibly they didn't want to because either he, uh, he would make them unclean because he was bleeding. And of course, blood is a, is a, is an instrument of defilement or even worse, if the man was dead to touch a corpse would be a defilement. So since both of them are in the service of the temple and they're going to Jerusalem, neither of them want to risk being defiled. So they would be prohibited from doing temple service. And maybe they were just hard-hearted. Of course, that's certainly quite possible too. But in any case, neither of them helped this man. However, there was a Samaritan that came along. Now, I think it's interesting that Jesus talks about him as being a Samaritan. Maybe if Jesus had been in Samaria, he might have told a story about the good Jew. Uh, I don't know. But uh, in any case, he talks about the good Samaritan. And the Samaritan stopped and he ministered to this man. He uh, he cleansed his wounds. He took him to an inn. Uh, he paid for his stay and, in fact, said, if he owes anything more, I'll be coming back this way and I will pay anything extra. So in the end, Jesus reverses this question. The young man has asked, who is my neighbor? But Jesus asked the young man, which of these three was a neighbor to the man who fell among thieves? The point of this is that the person who is a neighbor is the person who has a need. And if you are going to be a neighbor to a person who has a need, you are going to be a neighbor by ministering to that person's need. And Jesus, of course, is the best example of all of this kind of ministry. Then there is some teaching on prayer. Now, 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 Luke has given a pronounced emphasis on the prayers of Jesus, and we've seen that in several places. Jesus prayed alone. He prayed in the mountain. He's in prayer at his baptism. He's in prayer when he goes to the Mount of Transfiguration. Uh, he teaches the disciples a prayer, uh, which we're going to talk about in just a moment. But he's given this, this, this emphasis on prayer. And now we are going to find that one time when he was praying, his disciples came to him and asked him, to teach them to pray. John the Baptist had taught his disciples a prayer, and they wonder if perhaps Jesus would now give them such a prayer to recite. And so Jesus does. He responds with what we typically call the Lord's Prayer. Now, oftentimes when you hear people talking about the Lord's Prayer, you hear the emphasis that this is a pattern for prayer, that it starts with reverence, recognition of God. Eventually, uh, you know, we'll talk about the kingdom of God, and then about uh, daily needs and those sorts of things. And I don't think that's wrong. I, th I think that, in fact, is, is probably an appropriate pattern for prayer. But also, I think it's important to note that when Jesus gave this to the disciples, he said it this way. He said, when you pray, say. That seems to indicate that this is a prayer that should be recited, memorized, in other words. And in fact, that is the way the earliest Christians took it. And they would begin to use the Lord's Prayer as part of regular worship from the very beginning. And in fact, it is still used that way in many, many churches today. Uh, the entire congregation will recite the Lord's Prayer, just as Jesus taught his disciples, when you pray, say. 
So it begins with an address of God as Father. Probably in Aramaic, this is the word Abba. Later in the letters of Paul, for instance, we find Paul saying, uh, we address God as Abba. And that probably goes back to the Lord's Prayer itself. Abba is the child's word for Father. I think it is to the point that this expression is not part of the Old Testament address to God in prayer, nor was it part of the way Jews within Judaism address God in prayer. In fact, this address of God as Father or my Father or Abba is a unique feature that Jesus taught in prayer, and it describes this intimate relationship of a child with a parent, a child with a father. Uh, this was not typical of Jewish prayer, not typical of Old Testament prayer. Then in the prayer, there are two what I would call thou clauses, uh, clauses that directly address God and the kingdom of God. There is, first of all, a statement of reverence, hallowed be your name. This is the way we say it in uh, sort of Old Testament English, but that means reverence, uh, your name be revered. And then there is the prayer uh, request or the intercession for the rule of God. May your kingdom come. Uh, this is the rule of God. This is king, kingdom, not in the sense of, of, uh, of a ge geographical area, but rather in the sense of the rule of God or the authority of God. Then there are two we petitions in which the person praying asks God for certain things in his behalf. First of all, he's going to say, give us daily sustenance or daily bread. Now, most people worked uh, at subsistence living, so they earned enough money each day for food for that day. So daily bread basically is a way of saying, help us to have enough funds to buy bread that we need for every day uh, or daily sustenance. And then there is the prayer for forgiveness. Forgive us our trespasses. Uh, and of course, there is within this also the idea that we should forgive others as well. We ask God to forgive our trespasses, but of course we also must be careful that we forgive everyone who is indebted to us. That means that the mercy and generosity of God to us must be the pattern by which we extend generosity and mercy to others. So we forgive as God has forgiven us. And then the prayer ends with a conclusion, don't let me fall victim to temptation. At least that's what I think is the nuance of this. Uh, the way it is translated and the way it actually reads in the Greek text is uh, do not lead us into temptation. Uh, a number of scholars have translated this from Greek back into Aramaic, and in Aramaic it kind of has more this idea, do not let me fall victim to temptation. Uh, I'm not sure absolutely that's the way it should be read, but I tend to think that is probably the best way. In any case, there is a marked priority of sequence in this prayer. First, you pray for God's will and for God's kingdom. Only then do you pray for personal needs. Many centuries ago, Martin Luther said most people pray this prayer backwards. They start with personal needs. This is what I want. This is what I need. And uh, they may get to God's will and God's kingdom, but that's kind of secondary. But Luther points out, and I think Luther is quite correct, that this priority of the prayer is in the order in which Jesus gave it. You first reverence the Father. You first pray for God's will and God's kingdom. And then you it can extend that prayer for your own personal needs. Then there uh, is a story Jesus gives about the friend at midnight. Uh, again, this is a parable about prayer, but it is a parable of contrast. Now, it is important to note that some of Jesus' parables are not parables of similarity, but parables of contrast, and this would be the latter. Jesus is not saying God is like a stingy neighbor. In fact, the point is that God is not like this but instead he gives generously to those who ask and those who seek him. And most of all, he will give the Holy Spirit, which is the greatest gift of all. 
As he is inter interacting with some of his critics, Jesus gave the parable of the strong man and the stronger man. Uh, once again, you have this idea of the finger of God. Uh, the finger of God is a sign that the kingdom of God has come in the ministry of Jesus. But in this, in, in this discussion, Jesus is going to say that the spiritual world abhors a vacuum. In other words, if demons are expelled from a person and he is set free from the influence of evil, but he does not turn his life around in order to, to follow Christ or follow the good, these demon squatters, I'm going to call them squatters, are going to return in full force. And, and, and where previously he only had one, now he's going to have seven. He's going to be worse than he was when he started. So you, you can't just simply uh, uh, have, have evil expelled from your life. You must replace that was something that is good and positive and toward the kingdom of God. And now from this time on, Jesus is going to begin to face more and more opposition. There are various groups among the Jews that are going to interrogate Jesus, are going to question him, and so there's going to be quite a series of those. I've put side by side for you uh, a set of what are sometimes called the conflict uh, stories. Uh, and so you see the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all of them have much of the same kinds of things discussed. Some of them have uh, some that the others don't. But all of them show that in these last weeks of Jesus' ministry, increasingly he's going to meet voices who rise up against him and are critical of him. In response to that, some of them have asked for a sign. Now that in itself seems odd. Jesus has done incredible miracles. He's healed lepers. He's raised people from the dead. Uh, what more could you want from, than that? But still, they are pushing hard and asking Jesus for a sign. And Jesus is not going to respond to them. He's going to say, there's not going to be any sign for you except the sign of Jonah. His miracles are, are signs, but they want more than that. And so no sign is going to be except the sign that Jonah gave, which is the call to Nineveh to repent. That's the only sign. You need to repent. You need to change your mind. In fact, Jesus said foreigners would eventually rise at the judgment to condemn those who reject Jesus. Even though they were outsiders, they had listened in ancient world. Um, the Queen of the South came all the way from, uh, Jesus says, the ends of the earth. I'm not sure where she came from, probably from somewhere in Arabia. But in any case, she came to see the wisdom of Solomon. But now, greater than Solomon is here. And so foreigners are going to rise in the judgment to condemn those who have rejected Jesus. And in this teaching where Jesus mentions the Queen of the South, for instance, or the men of Nineveh, there is, I think, more than a hint that eventually, the mission of Jesus is going to spill out beyond the Jewish boundary toward the nations of the world. Now we come to a situation in a Pharisee's home where Jesus has been invited for a formal dinner. But he doesn't first wash his hands. Uh, a couple of lessons ago, I mentioned uh, this idea of the baptism of hands. And this is the verb that is used here in the Greek text of Luke's Gospel the baptism of hands. Uh, Jesus doesn't do this. Now, this is not something that is required by the Torah of Moses. It's not in the written Torah. This is an idea that comes from the oral Torah. So this is one more of those situations where Jesus is not going to follow the oral Torah in the way that the Pharisees expect him to. Uh, so he doesn't first baptize his hands or pour water over his hands. And out of this, Jesus uses this occasion to address religious hypocrisy. And he's going to pronounce six woes. Now, this is very typical of the ancient prophets. You're going to find the prophets pronouncing woes in much this very same way. In fact, back in the book of Isaiah, uh, you're going to find six woes as well. Uh, the most extensive treatment of this is going to actually be in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 23. But you still have it here in Luke's Gospel, where he pronounces woes upon religious hypocrisy. So the baptism of hands, not part of the written Torah, uh, part of the oral Torah, but the adherence to external tradition. While it might seem to be a sign of holiness, 
could actually mask greed and wickedness and even the corruption of death, uh, even the rejection of God. You can be a religious person and still reject God. This is the message of Jesus. Now, as we go forward in our next uh, lesson, we're going to look at some of the warnings Jesus gives toward those who uh, are surrounding him, and we're also going to take a look at some more of his parables. So this is the end of the fifth lecture, and we will see you in the beginning of the next one.